Welcome to Fright Fix. My name's Sook. My name's Celia. How are you doing, Celia? Yeah, I'm doing good, thank you. I um I got caught in a torrential thunderstorm at lunchtime today. I mean, oh, really? it was thunder, <laughs> it was pouring, it went from you know really nice to horrible. So feeling a little bit sorry for myself, I'm not gonna lie. Oh, my favorite kind of uh, rain to be caught in is when the sun's still shining and it's still warm and then you, and then it pours down with rain. There's something weird yeah. and refreshing about that kind of like. There is, but I always look up directly up to see where the clouds are and just get kind of a face full of rain every single time. And I have never <laughs> learned to not look up when it's raining. Oh, it's raindrops <laughs> cleaning your eyeballs. Yeah, exactly. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I had my um, second COVID jab today, so yeah. I was feeling a bit under the weather earlier on. But, you know, the show must go on and we you know, can't delay these episodes, so we've got to do it. Oh, you're such a trooper. Well, I hope you'll be able to kind of keep your mind off it with our amazing podcast episode. This week, we will be reviewing the 2009 horror Drag Me to Hell, directed by Sam Raimi and stars Alison Lohan as Christine Brown. Find your Fright Fix anywhere you listen to podcasts and follow us on social media at Fright Fix Podcast. So before we continue, as always, we're giving a spoiler warning because we will be discussing the film to the end. So if you haven't already watched it, please do so before listening. Uh, as of recording this podcast, Drag Me to Hell is available on Netflix in the UK. Christine, a banker, refuses to extend an overdue mortgage held by an elderly gypsy woman. But the gypsy places a curse on Christine. Terrorised by an evil spirit, Christine endures three days of escalating torment. Somehow, she must find a way to lift the curse before she is dragged to the depths of hell to burn for all eternity. Duh. <laughs> So, what were your overall thoughts of this film? I am intrigued. Right. Now, I apologise in advance if I forced you to watch a movie you didn't enjoy. (laughs) (laughs) But, I mean, Drag Me to Hell is, it's like a proper in-your-face kind of horror. It's almost like a caricature of what people think horror movies would be or should be. I mean, there's so many, like, kind of uh, comic kind of moments in this film, like everything from the fly or you know the creepy shadows and the yeah. over the top exaggerated gory moments mm-hmm. um you know the film is super gross like it and it yeah. doesn't really um hold back on the grossness and you know, everything from the old lady's slimy false teeth and the Ugh. mucus she spits out you know Ugh. there's so much of that and it's like different to it's very different to every other horror movie we've reviewed on this channel mm. or this podcast rather and uh just this i don't know there's so many memorable gross bits like when when the lady you know when the gypsy lady loses her false teeth and she's there like sucking away on christine's oh, chin just slurping chin. away <laughs> oh you've just brought back some memories that i wish i just forget <laughs> yeah, and it's like when she pukes out bugs or whatever it is or you know like, yeah. it's all this kind of stuff very gross that they don't hold back but that is actually it's like a trademark for sam raimi actually uh, mm. and uh yeah i couldn't help feeling that this project was probably like a sigh of relief for sam raimi during the early 2000s especially because he spent like the best part of a decade directing the first three spider-man movies with toby Maguire. Right. and i can uh, imagine you know working in a big studio system and you know his kind of uh, roots are in like these kind of b-movie style horror movies because mm-hmm. he directed all the evil, evil dead movies so yeah imagine kind of returning to you know like his kind of camp horror roots you know must have felt good for him and probably a lot more fulfilling than working on a big studio film like spider-man and uh and i think uh, a visual representation of kind of him returning to his horror roots is like you know the um there's that yellow car that there's a delta 88 uh that features earlier on in the film yeah that the gypsy drives yeah 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 so i think yeah. that car is the car used in some of the evil dead movies ah um, so a nod back to his roots yeah i like that yeah so I think that is like a visual representation of Sam kind of returning to his roots. And I think, I, I mean, just watching the film, I got the impression he had a lot of fun making this and it's probably a yeah. hell of a lot less studio interference. And, and I feel for me personally, I felt like that kind of fun vibe came across in the film. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> now mm. put me out of my misery. What did you think? <laughs> <laughs> um. Right. Okay. So when I first started watching the film, I was a bit confused because I wasn't sure if it was supposed to be a 
uh, you know, a solid good horror film. It just had a bit of bad CGI, yeah. or if it was supposed to be comedy. And yeah. I think that ruined it for me because I spent Ooh. the whole film thinking, I'm not sure where where this film sits. Like, sure, I don't know sure. if it's not scary movie because it's not as obvious as that. No. But it doesn't have many things for me that make horror films really amazing. Yeah, um, yeah. So I kind of felt like I was in a bit of a twilight zone, if I'm honest, yeah. because I kept, I actually messaged you while I was watching it to check I was w- watching the right film. <laughs> because Oh, is that why you messaged? <laughs> that's why I messaged you because I had, I could... I was like, is this the film we're supposed to be watching? Because right. I just couldn't understand it. And I think sure, sure. maybe I didn't give it the credit it might have deserved, kind of looking back at it now. But while I was watching it, I have to admit, I hated it. I really oh, didn't like it. No. Yeah, I know, I know. Oh, there has no. to be one. There has to be one. And it's not that I don't have a sense of humour. Because I, if something was funny, I would find it funny, I think. Sure, <laughs> sure, sure. Or if I find something lighthearted, I get it. And yeah. I think looking back at the film I kind of understand that it is supposed to be this kind of you know over exaggerated slightly comical version of what a horror film can be but for me the storyline it didn't grab me no the character the the acting didn't grab me and for that reason I was kind of left a little bit disappointed thinking that I was going to get a bit more out of this I was never scared and you know that that's my thing I love being scared yes Um, and you know I, I did do a little bit of googling afterwards because I was really interested in what people thought of the film and I know it won an award for best horror film at the 2009 Scream Awards and the 2010 Saturn Awards yes I was reading this thinking did we watch the same film (laughs) (laughs) best horror film best horror film yeah I I just didn't personally I didn't understand why because it wasn't scary yeah it was verging on the edge of being funny but there were just elements which I'll get into later I think (laughs) that that made it (laughs) just not work for me and I was looking at reviews and everyone was saying this is a really scary great horror film everybody should watch it and I just feel like I'm in a little bit of a different world to everybody else I probably have the wrong end of the stick and you can convince me otherwise but for me it it just didn't didn't hit the mark You've actually kind of made my day in a weird kind of way. I'm, I'm I'm a little bit disappointed that I recommended a film to you that you didn't like. So I feel like I wasted your time a little bit. But at the same no. time, I'm also kind of relieved that we're finally doing an episode where we have polar opposite opinions on the movie. Yeah. Which never happened before. But because I didn't like the film doesn't mean that like I don't enjoy it and I would love yeah. to speak about it and actually I've been more excited about this podcast for the reason that I thought we would have different opinions and I'd love to know from somebody <laughs> who does like it I mean what the hell are you thinking <laughs> <laughs> and the other way around like maybe I'll end this going you know what it was actually a really good film I just <laughs> completely missed the point <laughs> No, no, that's fair. That's fair. I think it's because with Sam Raimi's movies, if I mean, so his earlier movies, like the Evil Dead films are like these kind of gory, over the top, super camp kind of not not hard horror, but kind of just like shocking kind of horror movies. Mm. And I think um, this movie, uh, Drag Me to Hell is like, you know, what happens if Sam Raimi is given a budget? I don't know Sam Raimi's films and I don't have a history with watching his films. So maybe that's something that I'm missing is that I wasn't excited to watch this film because of who directed it. Sure, I, sure, I, sure. I came into it blind and I suppose as somebody, yeah, who, who didn't, I don't really know the backstory of his career that maybe I've, yeah, like you say, missed the point of he's had this budget and he's working with who his style um, in a very free and flexible sense. And that would be really enjoyable for somebody who knew that that's what was going on. But but to in, to be fair to you with any movie or horror movie, especially something that's not a franchise film in isolation, it should be good. So you shouldn't mm-hmm. be expected to know the backstory yeah, you're, yeah, of, you're an, right. of anything. And, and you know, it's not like this is part seven of a franchise. This is just mm-hmm. like a standalone film. So so I totally hear what you're saying, totally. Mm-hmm. And on, on the film should be good on its own merits. Yeah, that is a good point, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So well, what did you... <laughs> I know you kind of like <laughs> mentioned it briefly, but what are your thoughts on the, the performances, the casting, the acting? So casting, I, I you know, I think that they... They did a good job. The acting is a different story for me. (laughs) (laughs) I read 
someone who reviewed the film and said, Drag Me to Hell is arguably Alison's most well-known role, who plays Christine. Yeah. And she puts a lot of effort into bringing the character to life. I've written that down because it's the opposite of what I think. (laughs) So... For me, the thing that stood out was the fact that if you want to do a kind of over the top comical nod to horror films, that doesn't mean that you have to um, lose good acting. It doesn't mean that you can get away with, for me, not making it feel like you're really going through something. And I think the main way that it didn't work with the character of Christine is that these things are happening to her, which are, you know, ridiculous and scary. And she acts like basically nothing's happened. But there's no point in the film where I feel... A- maybe at the end, but throughout the kind of three days of her curse, I just don't feel like she really cares. And I can give a few examples of what I mean. (laughs) So, right. The most traumatic thing that would ever happen to someone is if you went to a funeral and there was an old lady and you tripped and you fell onto the old lady and the old lady's juices, lack of a better word, (laughs) went in your mouth And she just gets up and carries on her life like nothing's happened. There's not even a moment where she's like, oh my God, like it, she just kind of, and I was thinking, why has this not affected her? Why isn't she leaving that shaken? And like, (gasps) something's happened to me. She spurts blood everywhere out of her nose. Like, you know, (laughs) (laughs) and then she just carries on with her day covered in blood and goes and tries to find this gypsy woman in her granddaughter's house and there was a seat you know she so she's got this blood spurting everywhere and then she walks up to the door of the granddaughter's house and she just kind of wipes her nose with a tissue and puts it in the bin and the look on her face is like the least bothered thing i've ever seen and i was just thinking I mean, I don't think it would lose the comedy or or whatever was supposed to be happening if she gave a performance that made you think that she was actually going through something. I was never invested in her character because of these scenes where it didn't seem like it bothered her at all. Like she kills her cat and doesn't seem phased. There's no consequences or no aftermath or anything. There's no consequences. And like I said, I don't think that just because the film is supposed to be exaggerated means that they shouldn't have actors that and I'm not saying it's her as an actor I'm saying maybe it's the character that she plays I think what she did with the character is great but it's it's the reactions to things that I just thought I, I, I don't know it just didn't sell me <laughs> <laughs> uh, what about you what did you think I can't disagree with anything you've just said. You're absolutely right. I I think it just in my mind, I just accepted from very early in the film that everything's going to be pretty shallow. Mm. Like um, for me, I think it was that whole bank sequence right at the beginning when um you know she's going for the promotion and you know, the bank manager's like well you know you gotta be a tough seller or I don't know I don't remember mm. what he's saying you know you gotta be really you gotta make difficult decisions and everything just everything about that whole sequence was so cliched and yeah. so run-of-the-mill and I think that scene mm. in itself just kind of defined the tone of the movie for me like uh, it was just all very mundane and very kind of seen it play out a million times and just how everyone reacted to each other it kind of s- subconsciously told me the rules of the film so I kind of just accepted it from there but listen I'm not yeah. disagreeing with what you've said like she went through some really horrific things and there was no real kind of trauma for her <laughs> throughout the film no like, not at all I think yeah. what you know cliche is a perfect word that you used that this film is a massive cliche and that it does feed into all of these different cliches but but does that make it a good film if all it does is play into what you expect a film to do that's that's I think that's kind of what you've hit on that annoys me about it is like yeah, yeah. if it could do something that almost changes the way we view these cliches then that would have been really interesting but the fact that it it plays into everything and you almost know exactly what's going to happen next yeah it, apart from a few scenes which I'll, I'll give I'll give it um, it, you know, for me, that doesn't make it a good film. That just makes it a film that is just doing what it's saying it's going to do. But yeah. then the other side of that, as you said, is you kind of have to suspend your disbelief and go with it and enjoy it for what it is. And maybe that's just not what I was able to do. So yeah, I I, I, I see both sides. Absolutely. It's it's like a stoner horror film almost, or it's like, you mm. just have, it's one of those kind of movies where you just have a few drinks, you have a pizza, and then this is the kind of crap you watch or whatever. Yeah. It's, it's like, um, it's just, I don't even know if it's 
B movie. It's this like C movie quality kind of storytelling and whatnot. Yeah. And uh, it's if if like say The Conjuring Two or something is like a steak, this film is a happy McDonald's Happy Meal. Yeah, that's such a yeah, good metaphor yeah. because. I mean, you can still get something from a McDonald's Happy Meal. You still get yeah. satisfied, just not for very long, and it doesn't leave you wanting more. It's not very nutritious you still have for your it. brain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like that. Did you have a favourite scene? Uh, I did have a favourite scene, actually. Or not not a, necessarily a scene, but just a moment. But before I get mm. to that, I'll just kind of cover a few uh, bits that I found quite uh, memorable. Firstly, mm-hmm. throughout the film, something that only really occurred to me, like, right up until the end was like there are so many things that go into Christina's mouth mm-hmm. in this film there's like starts off very small with like the little fly that travels into her mouth or whatever and then there's yeah. like the dead bodies uh the dead gypsy woman's bile goes into her mouth there's Whoa. the bit where she throws up all those I don't know if they were maggots or something like yeah fed into her mouth there's the, the damn handkerchief fights to go into her mouth. Go into her mouth, yeah. <laughs> then it kind of like there's an entire arm that goes into her mouth when she's in the sh- in her garage mm-hmm. or something. But I just th- thought that was kind of like a, a bit of a... I didn't see it as a theme until... Or a running joke until mm-hmm. the entire arm went into her mouth towards, the, towards the, the latter part of the movie. I'm so glad you picked up on that because that is my theme that I'm going to talk about later. Um, so hopefully maybe I'll be able to kind of think about why they did that. Um, but I'm glad you picked up on it because I did as well and I had to do some more research. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> yeah, because uh, you normally come out with something quite intelligent and uh, I didn't really sense it any levels of intelligence through this movie so I'm really intrigued <laughs> to see what you're gonna say I'll give it a bit of credit <laughs> yeah there's um I had a kind of um towards the beginning of the film I was a little bit conflicted with uh with the whole kind of premise like how um you know this this because generally with he- heroes or protagonists of a movie you know they're built as quite sympathetic or you can kind of feel what they're going mm-hmm. through you know but when um that the gypsy lady comes in and asks for an extension of the loan and and you know the obviously the Christine can't do that but then the gypsy lady's like please you have to help me I'm begging you and you know then Christina kind of like you know kicks the gypsy lady off her mm. like I, I don't know just like kind of I suppose at, at a moral level or an ethical level I was a bit conflicted at that point because Christine's just like a, a cog in the banking system yeah. you know like she at what well, at well it was only revealed later on in the movie that she did have a choice but up until that moment she had no choice and I just kind of felt like mm-hmm. who's this entitled old lady who's gonna suddenly put a curse on her on this kind of like you know I don't know I don't know if you had any feelings about that bit but yeah it kind of just put me in a weird mindset like as to what the you know what was driving the movie and why Mm -hmm. Christina kind of fell into this kind of problem in the first place yeah that's definitely something I picked up on for me it was that The consequences didn't seem very high. The fact that she denied her a loan for her house, it just felt like it, like you say, it it didn't really seem like Christine had done much wrong. I mean, even if she did have a choice, it, it's still a kind of official business and she's doing her job. I mean, maybe that's the point. Maybe it's that it didn't really matter what she'd done. You know, the gypsy woman had this kind of vendetta against her for something that was quite minor. Um, But for me, it kind of stood out and it's something I didn't like about the film was that it could have been a really interesting view on morals if it was much more kind of ambiguous about who was right and who was wrong. For this, it was like, well, it doesn't really matter because the the thing that they're arguing over isn't very like major. And I don't know, I think they could have worked with that a lot more um, if maybe, I don't know, the old woman had stolen something and um but she'd stolen it because she really needed it and christine told on her or something and then there's yeah. that that dilemma of well she's stealing something from a from a from wherever it is and that's a bad thing but also does it does christine have to do anything about that i don't know something that would have shown that there could have been two sides but for me this yeah. kind of denying alone was like well she she did her job yeah. and there wasn't much moral ambiguity to it yeah and the bank did approve a few extensions yeah to, it kind of yeah, seemed reasonable yeah. um and i did but i did read somewhere that it's supposed to be a kind of the audience is able to get back at all of their loan officers who have denied them in the past uh, and really it's supposed to be a bit of like a vindication of everybody who's but it just doesn't feel like that no. to me it just feels like meh, 
I mean, she did her job and it, it didn't work out the way it, the gypsy woman wanted. It didn't. No, that didn't come across to me either. But maybe we've just, maybe if you're on a certain side of being financially stable or secure you'd probably mm. have very different views on that i mean i don't think either of us are yeah. like loaded or anything but i think mm. we're just normal comfortable yeah. whatever but so that's probably why we maybe struggle to see the other side where people are struggling and living hand to mouth and maybe mm. they would probably cheer when when yes you know, when the bank put, teller or whatever is you know Mm. punished or whatever I don't know maybe yeah I I mean that's a really good point I think what would have made that work really well then is if the gypsy woman was a bit more of a sympathetic character yes yeah um you know didn't leave her teeth on the table and put all the sweets (laughs) in her bag and tapped her gross fingernails on the (laughs) desk you know she she's made out to be the villain from the start and so you don't really feel that bad for her whereas if she was a disguised kind of witch or something it might have made those like you say those feelings kind of come forward a little bit mm, mm. and yeah 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 uh, I mean maybe if it was made more in a way where this was a test for Christine to see if Christine would pass this test where she yeah. kind of shows some kind of compassion towards this old lady who's struggling mm. but obviously at the end of the movie it's then discovered that Christine did have an option but she chose yeah. not to take it and that's the, the kind of I don't want to say twist at the end but you kind of feel less sorry for her and yeah she had character story. slightly shifts a little bit yeah yeah i mean this isn't really a theme that i picked up on but something where i couldn't help feeling that maybe the film was some kind of i mean i'm kind of clasping at straws here right now but maybe some kind of feeling that it was something about selling your soul to climb that corporate ladder or Mm, yeah uh, yeah Yeah. so maybe if that gypsy lady was like a test and you know she was Mm -hmm. kind of begging and seeing how christine would react and even though Christina was just like a cog in the banking system, you know, with no real power to do anything. But, you know, as Christina kind of climbed, she didn't really climb the ladder, but, you know, I think she started getting a bit more respect from her manager. But as she started doing that, I just felt like little pieces of her soul or humanity were kind of being mm. removed. Like when she started shouting at people or I don't know. Yeah, that's a really good point. I hadn't thought about that before. Yeah, she's kind of sold herself, her soul to capitalism and therefore she's kind of cursed by the the old ways in in with the gypsy woman of you've yeah if you sell your soul then i'm gonna try and take it yeah that's really interesting Hmm. yeah maybe maybe um i thought the uh scene i did like very early on in the film was the car fight scene when uh (laughs) they're in the underground car park i just thought it was so hilarious and so disgusting and so relentless and uh but there was that one bit at the beginning where she's uh, christina is kind of looking around she's sat in a car and she's kind of looking around and the camera turns around and you see the back seat and you just see the shadow of the woman of the gypsy lady in the car and it just the camera just holds there for a little while and you're kind of like that's the defining moment where which type of horror movie is this going to be is it going to be like a conjuring type thing because you can Mm -hmm. see the shadow there which kind of scare is going to give you but it decides to go down this hilarious kind of yeah m- mode from that moment onwards and um the car scene that whole fight in the car just escalated and escalated and escalated like and you just know, kept it, going and yeah. going and going I, <laughs> yeah. to be honest i did think she was going to wake up at some point i thought it was all a dream because it was so ridiculous yes, i was like this yeah. can't be real and it, it was <laughs> yeah and i think any sympathy for that woman for the for the for the gypsy lady was kind of killed for me in that scene because it's like mm-hmm. she's massive overreacting why is she trying to kill christina like you know yeah like so so in a weird kind of way like yeah you're building up more sympathy for christina for this kind of lady who's just being tormented kind of irrationally and kind of yeah and yeah yeah um there so there was one scene that i really liked in the film and it was just a moment and it was the um, the bit where christina meets her boyfriend's parents for the first time mm mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, very early on in the film, the setup kind of is, you know, the boyfriend is from, you know, played by Justin Long. He's from like a well-to-do family and his parents like want him to marry into status. Like, you know, yeah. want, want him to get, oh, yeah, we got this other girl for you. And, you know, she's a lawyer or whatever. And, you know, you guys go places, but, you know, Justin Long just wants his parents to meet Christina. And when they, when, you know, they first go to meet uh, Justin Long's parents. Sorry, I've forgotten the character name. You know, I think it's like, Clay Dalton it's like the most uh generic name ever Clay Clay. yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah 
Yeah, so like, you know, the, his parents are like making farm jokes and farm comments. Oh, is this mm-hmm. the kind of cake you make at the farm? Oh, is this what you do at the farm? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you can tell that, you know, Christine's kind of like, she's kind of out of her depth. But then there's one moment where they start talking about Christine's parents and, you know, yeah. and you could tell that she's uncomfortable about it. But then she just kind of is kind of pushed into a corner and then she reveals that, yeah, my mother was an alcoholic. Mm hmm. And I think it's at that moment where suddenly Justin Long's mum is like, she kind of changes her view on Christina. Yeah, you can see and, it. Yeah. Yeah. And then she's like, you know what? My, yeah, my uh, mum was, a, or my dad was an alcoholic or something. Mm. So they kind of like bond over that. And I, and in in the movie, it's all just like the rest of the film. It's all very shallow and it's not like there's any Oscar winning acting to any of it. But I think it was, I think like in life, it's like when I try to be like how I am with people, I try not to be too different with different people. Mm-hmm. like a different character I try to be the same character I am like with everyone and, and I try to be upfront with people mm. and, and I generally find that when I'm kind of like you know pretty honest about whatever's going on they tend to be they tend to open up as well yeah. I'm not a fan of being around very secretive people yeah and there's something about that particular moment that resonated with me like when she opened up and just put her cards on the when Christina just put her cards on the table you know someone who is from a different kind of status in life mm-hmm. Or different station in life you know they you know they were kind of almost leveled they were brought to the same level and there was yeah. a kind of a respect there and I think it's something about you know like giving to people as much as you're being given so not in, not in terms of a possession thing but in terms of conversationally or an emotional level and yeah just something about that particular moment resonated with me quite a bit and funnily it's, it's none of the horror stuff that I kind of yeah you know, marks as my favorite scene it's just that moment that little thing stuck in my head and I don't know why, but yeah. It w- it was really heartwarming. I, I do completely agree. I think it was the probably the most human scene in that film that felt like it reflected a bit of, of reality. I suppose it is a good one to pick up on because it, yeah, it was also a much slower pace than the rest of the film. And I think it was like giving us a breather and it was, it was like a little golden nugget. It's like, <laughs> I know we're giving you a ridiculous film, but here's something that something human that you can, yeah, that you can take away and is, is actually a really sweet moment. Yeah. Yeah. So that's enough about the stuff I liked. Uh, what did, <laughs> <laughs> was there even something you liked? <laughs> <laughs> there was, I'm not going to say I hated everything about this film. Um, I I have to admit, you know, looking back on this film, I do like the idea of it and I do like the comedy. The fact that I couldn't get it the first time round, I think is why I'm saying I don't like it overall. Sure, but sure. Like, from what you're saying and stuff, it I do understand if I had just suspended my disbelief a little bit more, I might have enjoyed it slightly more than I did. You went in how you went in and, mm. you know, it the movie yeah. presented itself to you the way it did and you shouldn't yeah. have to prepare or anything. You know. Yeah, true. I think, you know, one one scene that I will give it credit for and the one that I really enjoyed was actually the scene where Christine digs up the body of the gypsy woman and oh, she's yeah. kind of having, she's wanting to give the object, the button back to her yeah. um, as a way of stopping the curse at the end of the film. And there was a lot of power in Christine in that moment. And I think I, I found it really satisfying. Like she went from a kind of meek, trying to go for this job, did, you know, didn't speak up for herself to this almost animalistic woman woman who is desperate to figure out the answer and she's kind of clawing away at the mud and she's covered Mm. in water and she kind of rips open this coffin and I think she says choke on it bitch and then she puts the button (laughs) or what she thinks is the button shoves it in the woman's mouth again the mouth yeah um and I don't know apart from it's like yeah you go girl like do it like you've been through a lot even though she didn't seem like she went through a lot she did go through a lot (laughs) and I don't know I just quite like that um that scene it kind of yeah it was a bit satisfying and sure sure what, what everybody would have wanted because the gypsy woman was clearly deranged and she was oh horrible. man yeah totally. and so yeah being able to get something back at her was was quite nice um <laughs> Yeah, I think I liked the twist at the end as well. I think the fact that she didn't actually give the button back and no. she still was under the curse and spoiler alert, she gets dragged to hell. Mm. Um, I think that was one of the only points in the film where I was like, ah, they actually thought about doing something slightly different. And I yes. like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, they didn't end it with the two ride away into the sunset on a train and get married and live happily ever after. Because no, you'd she think does, that. 
you think that and it and the whole film builds up to do that because like you said it plays into all the cliches and the biggest cliche is they live happily ever after so the fact that it doesn't do that I think yeah I, that was a moment where I was like okay yeah they're doing something a bit different um because I was thinking that that was gonna happen because you know she's in the car with, car with her boyfriend Clay and she has this white envelope that has the mm. button in it and she drops it on the floor and it's very noticeable that she drops it on the floor like everything in this film it's very on the nose yeah um so I'm thinking you know well it, he something's gonna happen she's gonna pick up the wrong thing but then she picks up a white envelope with something round in it and I'm like okay great she's got it back it's fine that was just a bit of a red herring yeah and, and but what it actually was was a coin from earlier on in the earlier on the film and i think yes. i think that was clever because it was quite subtle i wouldn't have remembered that there was a coin in a in an envelope no, before no, this no. i don't think course, and yeah, so yeah. it was kind of one of one of the only moments where it wasn't on the nose and it did actually trick me so i i give it credit for that it did it did do something um and yeah so i think Overall, it it wasn't my favorite film, but there were elements of it that I was interested and invested in. It's just a shame that it wasn't more of the film <laughs> other than just two parts right at the end. <laughs> oh, okay. So, like, uh, were there any scenes uh, or anything that you felt strongly about not liking? Not really. It was more just the overall. So I think I've gone through kind of the things I don't like. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think the biggest thing was the fact that the acting for me wasn't great sure, and sure, the character sure. development wasn't great. Um, and I just didn't feel invested in any of the characters, even in a film that is trying to be on the nose. It, it doesn't have to, like I said before, it doesn't have to not have elements that make you want to watch it. And yeah. for me, it was like, well, I don't, I don't think the curse was fairly given. I, you know, it wasn't something that was major. I don't think the gypsy woman's in the right. So I want her to go. Okay. Yeah. She's gone, yeah great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, because it plays into all the cliches, it ended up being a very easy movie to to predict in most yeah. parts. And I don't know, sometimes with films, I like to be challenged a little bit and, and, and have my mind changed. And I think one of the things that made this stand out was that, as I've mentioned before, my boyfriend hates horror films. Um, and he was watching it for part of it. And he turned to me and he said, this is exactly what I think when I think about a horror film. And I was oh, like, really? okay, yeah. <laughs> It's that image of a film that's way over the top, really in your face, you know, jump scares that aren't very scary, sure, acting sure, that isn't sure. great. And, and I think that's kind of what got me was like, yeah, this is kind of the, the type of horror that maybe people expect people who say, oh, I like horror films. This is what comes to mind. And there's like yeah. a whole slew of amazing horror films that really get you in certain areas. Um, and yeah, so I thought that was quite interesting. Did did Mike watch all of it with you? No, I, I he kind of got up halfway through and was like, not because it was too scary, which is usually why he gets up. Oh, it's just bored. But or just because he was kind of bored and it wasn't his type fair. of film. That's fair. Um, That's fair. What about you? Was there anything you didn't like? Yeah, um, I mean, just to just to add to to add to your point is um, the film did feel like what would a horror movie look like if MTV were given money to make a horror movie? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that's exactly like, it. Yeah, so I think Mike's observation was uh, was spot on. I think, and as I mentioned earlier on, I think the film is a caricature of what a horror yeah. movie would be. Yeah. So um, they weren't really. I think because I kind of accepted the film for what it was. Yeah. Very early on, or I just kind of like switched my brain up. There weren't really very many bits that I disliked because I felt like everything that was in the film was all the rules for me were defined very early on and I didn't really feel mm -hmm. like there was anything that kind of broke those rules so yeah. I kind of just accepted a lot of it I mean there were some bits that were uncomfortable other than I mean all the gore and stuff but that was just a part of the package so yeah but I thought the uh the kitten death uh bit was a bit much I mean I'm glad it yeah. happened because it was just you know the film just you know turning it up a notch as it did progressively throughout mm -hmm. the but man that was difficult for me to kind of yeah. process and uh and it's just that I just felt like Sam Raimi is just there manipulating and torturing yeah. me like through the kid, <laughs> when, when she killed the kitten because I thought no she's not gonna do it is she because the kitten's so yeah. cute I know but, but yeah you hear the kitten scream and then next thing it's being buried and I was like oh, it's being right. buried I know yeah that mm. that was but, but because her reaction wasn't like I can't believe I did that or you know what have I done 
it, it almost just fell flat and I was like, oh, well, she's done it now and nothing's actually happened. <laughs> yeah, no, no, 100% agree with you. It's like, imagine this story, this same script being given to someone like, I don't know, James Wan or something. Mm, I can a imagine. A whole different film. It would, yeah, this, despite being the same story, I can imagine it being a lot more developed and uh, a lot more drawn out. It probably would have been like a two and a half hour film in the hands mm. of James Wan, so... Uh, but yeah, um, I had a couple of questions for you, actually, just random kind of um, thoughts. Like, mm. what are you, what's your opinion on, like, fortune tellers? And do you have any experience or do you know anyone who's had experience with that kind of stuff? Yeah, so personally, for me, um, I've never got into it. Um, I lived with a, a girl at uni who did tarot readings and her family does tarot readings and she'd do tarot readings for me all the time really? and I loved it I thought it was really interesting um but it was never something that I truly gave myself to like I never I think I'm a bit of a skeptic when it comes to that sort of thing sure and um I I don't think I ever fully accepted that that what was being said was true because I guess it's it's always going to be quite generic and and you can bend what happens to you thinking about what what is read um yeah. but i always found it so interesting and i would want to do it all the time not just because i i necessarily thought it was real but because it's it's just a really interesting way of looking at life and thinking about things that could happen in the future that you might have already predicted or bending the things that happen to you to kind of fit these readings mm. it was just quite fun um and, you know, asking specific questions and getting results, as in being able to see them on the cards. It's just, for me, it was a bit of fun. And I thought it was really interesting. Uh, yeah, so a, a bit sceptical, but totally open to doing those sort of things, because I think that they're really interesting. What about you? Yeah, yeah. I've, yeah, no, I think I'm the same as you. Like, I don't um, really have much of an opinion on them. I suppose I've just never really had uh, any interactions. So, and I've always, yeah, like yourself, I'm always a bit sceptical. And uh, I'm always eager to meet someone who can prove me wrong. Like, yeah. I think a lot, of, a lot of stuff can be explained away by the vagueness of the readings. And yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there was one time. I mean, my sister would tell the story way better, but that kind of freaked me out. Where my sister, um, she used to work for Mercedes Benz, mm. uh, and um, she used to uh, be a receptionist. And uh, I think one time one of her colleagues was off sick or something. So they called like a temporary member of staff in or from another branch. Yeah. So they were both sat on the on the reception together. And then the girl turned around to my sister, you know, uh, you know, they make a small talk they got on. And then she turned around to her saying like, you know, I might not be at this branch again. Yeah, I want to tell you something. And my sister, my sisters like me, were very skeptical. We're not superstitious yeah. or anything. Uh, yes, I want to tell you something, but just want you to know that your your grandmother's very happy with your husband and she's watching over him and she actually walks she actually goes to work with him every day and wow. um he you know she's always she he makes her laugh or something and uh, i think at that point my sister was just like what mm. yeah um but yeah all my all four of my grandparents like died years ago so i never mm. really got to know any of them but so that, uh, she thought that was quite amusing and then she started um i mean she started uh, just saying stuff like, um, you're going to have another kid. And yeah. uh, anyway, it, that ended up happening like uh, yeah. very shortly after that. Then she was just like, uh, you have a brother who's uh, gone through some stuff, right? And he lives far away from you. And I was just, I think that was at that point when she started getting specific like that. Some yeah. people might say that's very vague. But that's, I think that's when my sister called me and was starting to, she was just reading off a lot of stuff. and Yeah, sister, and getting like, more uh, and more specific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, the girl just was like, just kept saying like, you know, I might not see you again because I'm only here temporarily, but I needed to mm. tell you X, Y, and Z. So I think my sister freaked the hell out. Like, uh, yeah. cause she was, because she, she's, she's probably more skeptical than I am where she can kind of like nitpick and pick out mm. all the flaws and everything but even when so she's kind of my barometer so it's like if she's yeah. freaked out then I'm kind of like I'm definitely uh, gonna be freaked out <laughs> yeah I don't think she ever met the girl again but it was just um it was yeah I wish I remembered more detail about the the interaction but I just found it quite that's funny. so interesting the fact that it just happened to be that I don't know she she was some sort of psychic or, or something that came in as the the temp I think <clears throat> It is really interesting. And I, I do I do like that this film kind of nods to 
the skeptics as well you know the fortune teller takes american express and you know he takes the money and things and it and it kind of you hear through clay all the things that skeptics would say when they go to a fortune teller um but what he says ends up being true so you've got both sides of it and yeah i think it's quite an it's quite refreshing to see a horror film that does take both sides quite seriously like it's valid to think both things yeah yeah i think when he there's the (laughs) There's the bit where he's like, something's being taken away from you. And he's like holding her hands and he's got yeah. her wrist there and he can see the buttons missing. And it's like that kind of stuff is what kind of yeah. gets me up about these kind of these readings. Like, oh, there's someone in your life. Oh, you've lost something. Oh, you're about to get something. It's just vague enough. But imagine in real life, if a, if a reader got so freaked out and said to you, keep the money, I don't need the money, just leave. <laughs> you know, oh, I'd be like... so, I'd be like, I'll, I'll pay you double. Just tell me. <laughs> Don't make me leave like this. Oh dear. Yeah, that was yeah. If um if uh you were in Christine's shoes and you had like a little button and you know you you had to give it to someone else, uh would you have given the button to someone else or the curse goes on someone else or would you have kept the button or what what would you have done? Oh, that's such a good question. I think when she was sitting in the diner and she was looking around at all the people trying to decide who she was going to give it to and she looks at that old man who's clearly, you know, not very well and she's about to give him the button and his wife comes along and and they look mm-hmm. so happy. Yeah. I really didn't want her to give the button to anybody. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I there was no one in the world, even the guy who, you know, was was up for the promotion with him with her that's just a man that wants a promotion he yeah. might not be a very nice person but can you give a curse to him for me the only way i think i'd be able to do it is if i was giving it to somebody who was in prison for life or had done something terrible or was dead i don't think i could give it to anybody who was just walking around um mm. because i feel like my biases towards what i like and what i don't like in people are just yeah. my preferences yeah. and so yeah. me choosing the fate of someone purely on what i agree with and what i don't you know like political stance or something like that yeah yeah would be yeah so unfair because that's just me and they're yeah. not catering to me by being who they are. And so I wouldn't, I, I just don't think I'd be able to. But the film also says you'd be surprised what you'd do when you're in that situation. Yes. So yes talking yeah. about cats. So I never know. Uh, you never know what's no, going on. No. What about no. you? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a bit of a difficult one, really. <laughs> I was hoping to kind of like uh, bamboozle you and get you thinking about an answer, but not thinking it through myself. It was. Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, you can say that you'd give it to me. It's fine. <laughs> no, but then we'd run out. Of, we won't be able to do more episodes. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, God. oh, so that's the only reason you would curse me. <laughs> oh, you're the only person I can talk to about this kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, it's. It's. I'm. I'm kind of almost glad Christina didn't give it to anybody else. Yeah. It kind of showed that she's. There is a, a. You know, a good person there, and you know, even though people mm-hmm. have kind of wronged her throughout the film and just kind of you know trodden on her you know she still kind of uh, remained you know had a you know she kept an ounce of integrity and I thought that's pretty yeah. good and I thought it was quite clever that they examined that like, potentially giving it to someone who's dying but then when they showed that guy's wife you know waddle into the frame yeah you know, so that's oh, that was cool. so heartwarming I, it was it's like even though the film is presented as a dumb movie I think I think we'd be surprised how much thought probably went into a lot of this film. And yeah, because uh, I think so is, so is Ivan and Sam Raimi that wrote the movie. And I think they'd actually mm-hmm. written it like back in the early 90s, well before they'd started on Spider-Man, but they couldn't really get on it until after the Spider-Man trilogy had been completed. But in answer to that question, I think, as you mentioned about the um, you know criminals, maybe if there was like a criminal who... I don't know, like some pedo or yeah, some yeah. murderer or something. I don't know. But someone who was guilty, guilty by their own admission and there's evidence, video evidence of them doing it or whatever. Yeah. I'd give it to that person, but not someone where the evidence was not 110%. Yeah, I agree. Sorry, I'm just asking you loads of questions now. <laughs> I uh, like I, it. I, this, this is the last one, I promise you. <laughs> 
um this it was well, it's not really a question for you to answer but well maybe you could but it was a there's a moment in the film where uh christina meets the granddaughter i think of mm-hmm. the gypsy lady and then the, she looks at christina and goes you used to be a fat girl or you used to be fat or something and christina's like yeah, yeah i used to be fat what was the point of that or why do you think that came up interesting that you bring that up because that and this is going to be a really long answer because this is what my theme is on actually this this week so that was the question that I was asking myself because they they do comment on her weight a few times and like you said earlier there's a lot of symbolism of things going in Christine's mouth like you said the fly um, blood gets in her mouth the dead woman's bile the handkerchief, the hand, the... I mean, it happens throughout the film. And yeah. I just couldn't wrap my head around why. And it was actually when she, the gypsy woman's daughter, uh, granddaughter opened the door and said, you used to be fat, that it clicked in my mind what that was. Oh. And so theories, and I, I looked it up and there have been a few theories about this, is that it suggests that the film is actually a metaphor for eating disorders. What? Because, yeah, because, and, and actually come to think of it, there's loads of evidence for it in the film because we know that Christine is trying to better herself by getting her job. Um, she doesn't think she's good enough for Clay after listening to the uh, conversation that he has with his parents about, you know, they they want him to be with someone else. It's building her up as a very insecure woman who's trying to make her life better. At right at the beginning of the film, she looks at those cakes. You remember through the window, she's like yeah. longingly looking at these cakes and she kind of shakes her head and walks away. She's denying herself this food for, and, and it seems to be part of her new image of somebody who's trying to be a successful woman in the city. She's moved away from her farming life. And we also know that she was the pork queen at her local fair in when she was at home. I can't remember yeah. who mentioned it, but we see a photo of her looking larger than she does now. Um, yeah, yeah, and she yeah. was crowned the pork queen. So we know that she has had issues with her weight in the past and that she, like I said, it's part of her image to try and change that. And she restricts herself quite a lot. Um, And I think that's the symbolism is that she's constantly battling things trying to get in her throat, like the flies, the blood, the vomit, Mm. the most disgusting things you could ever think of is a symbolism for for how it would feel to have a disorder like this, where things that enter your body do not feel right and they shouldn't be there. And I think that might be the body horror aspect of it as well, of that reluctance or refusal to eat. Um, And then another really interesting point where this comes up is when she's having dinner with clay's parents and they each have a piece of her harvest cake yes and she's looking at the cake and you and you can kind of see if she's wanting to eat it or not and she decides to eat it but as she's eating it an eye appears in the (laughs) cake and it looks at her and it's like for me it was a it was a judgmental eye that she she feels in her brain when she's eating something that's quote unquote unhealthy and she ends up choking on the the cake itself yeah and i think it kind of shows her rejection of eating it um and that that judgmental eye that's always looking at you when you're not in control of how you feel about food and at the end of the film when she shoves the button into the gypsy woman's throat yeah i think it's a symbolism of the curse if this metaphor is correct that the curse is her relationship with food And by kind of trying to almost shove this down someone else's throat, she's trying to stop the behaviors that she has by giving it to somebody else and like passing the curse of this relationship onto someone else. But ultimately it fails um, and she's kind of doomed to to burn in hell because of it. Well, I think the symbolism is that right at the end when she does get swallowed by hell, she ends up being a skeleton for a few seconds. Yes, And I think that that might be the kind of the end of the metaphor is that she was unable to get past this toxic relationship with food and ultimately becomes a kind of skeleton before dying and i think that this theory does kind of hold have have some weight to it because of that beginning and end it's all the way through and we've picked up on a few moments where we're like why is this film talking about food why is it talking about things going in her mouth and i and so i do think that this is probably a valid theory that's been kind of floating around um so it's well i think everything you've said uh adds up in my head now you mention yeah. it and it's like uh she has a uh, yes yeah, she yeah she ends up becoming swallowed up herself 
and uh, eaten yeah, us no, out. Yeah, no, that's so true. Yeah, I think yeah. if we went back and watched it, we would have we would find loads of points where it kind of symbolizes some sort of bad relationship with food, and it might be bigger than that. It might be the image of herself mm. and the way that she views herself. Um, so you know, I'll give the film credit for for doing that because I think that that was an interesting theme that was running through, and it showed Christine as a much more you know three dimensional person than perhaps she might first appear. Man, that's why I love talking to you about this kind of stuff because you always come out with like really intelligent. <laughs> deep things like this uh so uh, you you've you've suddenly made me uh think the movie i think you've made it go up in my estimations a little bit now after hearing that i like that i like that you're the one that likes the film and i've still helped you like it more <laughs> <laughs> you've reinforced it if anything yeah. <laughs> i wouldn't be a very good debater i think i just make somebody else believe in their own ideas more <laughs> no no i think debating is about seeing it from both sides and if you i think Absolutely. that's the sign of a good debater is to see from both sides i think you've, yeah. you've uh, exemplified that perfectly <laughs> Thank you. So if you were going to give this film a rating, our Fright Fix rating, <laughs> what would you give it? And I'm going to let you go first. Okay, well, I, I know our score is going to be very different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, for me, it, I thought it was a very accessible horror film. Mm -hmm. You know, it has some jump scares. It's. I thought it was hilarious. I thought the film yeah. was ridiculous. In my opinion, I thought the actors did the best they could with the... The, the, the little they had in terms of mm -hmm. kind of material i thought there was a lot of memorable stuff in the movie uh, i enjoyed it a lot and as an introductory so, so yeah so as an introductory horror film for someone who's maybe never seen the horror before at that level it's like top marks right like like 10 out of 10 but in the context of fright fix mm. you know i have to kind of assess it you know against the slightly more serious criteria you know was it scary did it leave an impression on me did it tap into something in my psyche and leave me thinking and in a weird kind of way i think it did especially after mm. your um uh just you know thoughts on the um the eating disorder thing uh but I, 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 but I will kind of deduct a couple of points uh, because the horror wasn't like horror, horror. It was, you know, more gross out horror. It wasn't thinking yeah. person's horror, uh, which, um, uh, you know, in my book kind of slightly lowers the, the rating. Mm. But I felt like the film was, uh, you know, the film knew what it was doing and it was committed to that kind of gross out ridiculousness. Yeah. And uh, for me, it probably would have been like a seven out of 10. But, you know, the fact that the movie had a talking goat in it kind of uh, mm. raises the mark to eight out of 10 for me. <laughs> eight out of 10 because of a talking goat with terrible CGI. Okay. Just, just tips <laughs> it over the, over the edge that by that much. Yeah. What about uh, you? Well... I think for me, it's a personal preference of the films I like. I don't sure. think it's saying that I'm saying that this film is inherently bad because like you say, there are, there are elements of it that make it entertaining. And what is a film if it's not entertaining? You know, if it can make you laugh, if it grips you for the hour and 30 minutes that it's playing, it's doing its job well. And I, I commend it for that. For me personally, it's not a film that I enjoy. Um, yeah. I've, I think that I love films that try and do something under the surface, even a little mm. bit. And and I think part of it for me was that it felt quite high budget for a low budget film. So like every <laughs> the music, every scene felt like it was staged. Every character felt like it had been molded by the thousand characters that have gone before them. Yeah, And that is probably the point. And I get that. I get that it's supposed to be a cliche. It's supposed to make you... Um, you know, as an avid horror fan, look back and say, oh, you know, I remember the roots of horror and I remember first watching a horror film and this is kind of bringing it back. And I get all of that, but just for me, it it didn't leave me with anything. And I, I wasn't entirely convinced that it did sure. what it needed to do. Um, yeah, so I think I, I'm probably going to give it a three out of 10. Wow. For me. Fair yeah. enough, fair enough. I, and and I've always said for me, like like you said as well, the horror aspect, the scariness of it is a massive factor. And the fact that it wasn't scary at all for me. I mean, I don't think I was scared once. Um, and maybe it was just that on Netflix, it called it a horror, not a horror comedy. That really got me because I was like, sure. it says it's a horror, 
and I have not been scared. And also it's not that funny to me. And I think all, oh, well, it was funny, but I wasn't letting it be funny because I didn't think it was supposed to be. Sure, if you sure, know what sure, I mean. sure, sure. So sure. I think I probably would have enjoyed it if somebody said, oh, it's kind of like scary movie, but not that ridiculous. Maybe I would have enjoyed it a bit more because I would have just said, okay, this is what the film is like you did. Um, but for me, I, I spent most of the film saying, is this the right film? <laughs> is this supposed to be funny? I, and yeah, it just took me far too long to figure it out. I think that it wasn't supposed to be. I think probably three quarters of the way through, I was like, okay, yeah, this this can't be. But you know, I was looking online at all the reviews, and and people really enjoy it. And I think they're exactly like you, Sook. They're they're taking it for what it is. And I think I'm the outlier here. I don't think you are. I think that I'm probably a bit of a harsh critic, giving it a three out of ten. Um, but that is just a personal preference. I think of the films that I like to see. I think I think your reasoning is entirely justified uh and strictly speaking you know at at a fright fix standard it's it's really not a scary movie Mm. Uh, we've we've watched a lot worse not worse a lot Mm. more scarier films so Mm. by that standard we've just gone and watched as i mentioned earlier like what mtv would consider a horror and it's very mainstream very accessible it's probably why so many people liked it because it was easy for them to watch it was yeah maybe uh, didn't demand too much of their brain uh, what I think we should start doing in future episodes, and maybe even this one, is actually start averaging out our scores to get an overall Fright Fix rating. Okay. So maybe this could be the first. So I gave yeah. it 8 out of 10, and I think you just gave it 3 out of 10. 3, yeah. So that would be 5 out of 10. Okay, I think that's that's not bad. I think I pulled it down quite a lot with my 3. <laughs> no, no, honest. no. I think I think it's fair, and I think the, the rating is the rating, and we should honour and, that. And it's locked in. Yeah, I think, you know, the thing that I can give this film is that there are so many different types of horror. I think we've spoken about this before. Horror doesn't have to just be hiding behind the sofa scary. It can be funny. It can be lighthearted. It can teach you something. It can be psychological. And this is just one of those different types of horror that people enjoy. Um, And I don't think that that makes it a bad film. I just think that if you do those types of horror, you have to except that some of your audience might not enjoy it for what it is, and that's okay. We hope you enjoyed this month's Fright Fix. Join us next month as we'll explore a new horror film. We will be posting the movie a few days before the podcast episode is released on our social media, so be sure to follow us at Fright Fix if you want to watch the film ahead of time. If you would like to send us a message or want us to cover a scary movie on an upcoming episode, please feel free to contact us on Instagram or Twitter or email us at podcast at frightfix.com. See you next time.